Gary Vaynerchuk is a serial entrepreneur, investor, and one of the most sought after public speakers alive today and a four times New York Times best-selling author. He went from being born in the Soviet Union, living in a studio apartment with eight other family members to building a net worth of $160 million. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Gary Vaynerchuk, and my take on his top 50 rules for success. Enjoy. There's a lot of uh, push towards being a workaholic and hard work is a learned behavior. I see it in my team, there's people that come into my, I've seen it in the thousands of employees I've had, which is the closer they are to the sun, the harder they work. And I'm like, aha. Uh -huh. And so I definitely feel like I learned hard work by watching my parents. Um, and so it's why I talk so much about hustle. Because it's one of the things that people can actually adjust and turn to. I, I watch people give advice completely predicated on natural talent and DNA and I'm like, Look, like I get it, like I can throw a football every day for nine hours a day, I'm just not physically built to be competitive at the highest levels. Mm. So yeah, I do think, you know, if anybody watching right now, if there's anything they take away, it's like, look, like you're gonna only be so pretty, you're only gonna be so smart, like, you, like th there's, there's things that are gonna be natural and then there's things that you can actually control. I do believe, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, I don't, but I do believe that work ethic is a taught behavior it's something you do have more control over. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think, and you know what really sealed the deal for me? Getting healthier. I was 38 years old and it didn't come natural to me. Like it didn't come natural to me at all. I hate the gym, I hate it now. I hate it, I don't like it, I don't wanna do it, um, but, I, but I knew it was important. And somewhere around midway through being 38 years old, I got serious, I figured out my system, I made the financial commitment, and I've won. 30 and a half, I'm on this random flight, I'm just laying there, not feeling tired, not feeling lethargic, no cliche thing, no heartburn, that I think I'm getting a heart attack, nothing. <laughs> I'm just laying there and I'm saying, you know, if I treated my health the way I treated businesses, I'd win. And so I just started, actually I remember what happened because I was like, that's not, doesn't feel right. I was thinking about my 40th birthday and I was thinking, you know, at 30, I changed my life. I went from the executor to, I need to go for it. If I don't do from 30 to 40, it's not gonna happen. So mm -hmm. let me go for it in that decade. And I was like, what am I gonna do at 40? Weirdly, I don't feel the same pressure I did at 30. I think I'm on a better career path. Like I don't feel the angst to like, it didn't feel right to triple down on work. <laughs> and so I said, health. Health is nowhere close to where it should be. Mm. I'm not, I'm, I'm, the way I make fun of people in business, you're not doing anything right that's gonna help you long term, I'm not doing anything right with health. When I that's turn 40, term, yeah. I'm gonna get serious. So then a week later I'm on a flight, again, <laughs> flights made me think, and I'm like, what the f am I waiting to 40 for? Mm. I could do a lot of bad in this next 18 months. 39, in November, this is around May, mm -hmm. and in November I'm gonna go for it. And literally the next morning I'm like, why? <laughs> Life is broken down into complaining and not. So if you're not complaining, well then I have, no, I have no advice for you. I'm, I'm pumped, like you did it. Like, like I have friends who make $42,000 a year, um, work nine to four, kind of, with an hour and a half lunch and 45 minutes of YouTube and 10 minutes of bullshit and an hour of complete wasted time in a meeting. So they're kind of working like six you know, hours a week, right? But, <laughs> but, but they're pumped. Right. And, and, and they text me, these are high school friends, and they'll text me like how happy they are to be the coach of their kid's baseball team. And you know, like that's amazing. Like that, that seems very obvious to me. Like that's like, that's right. Like, uh, you know what's super weird? I'm actually weirdly envious. You know, like I, it sounds cool, like in theory, right? Grass is always greener, right? Like right. far less pressure, you know, like, like 
all that time with my kids, oof, that would be cool. Like, there's just like all these things that I can justify. So to me, but I have friends who have $100 million in the bank because of Facebook's IPO, who complain, who are still hungry, who wanna do even more, who will complain to me, because they know I work a lot, about no work-life balance, and they don't get to spend enough time with their family, and I'm like, you have $100 million. Like, you could stay home. Like, you're in control. Like, you don't complain about it. You've made that choice. Don't bullshit me, like you want to spend more time with your family? Spend more time with your family. Who gets to decide what focus is? I have a wine company, a shoe deal, content, VaynerMedia, a wine library, Gary V, baseball cards I'm trying to sell, garage sale. I'm the least focused, focused you'll ever meet. <laughs> Guys, if you're a real entrepreneur, you kind of can't just do one thing. That's how we're fed up, right? Like, I'm gonna come up with three business ideas in the next hour, and I'm gonna do that every day, and I'll probably do two of them in the year, because that's what makes us happy. If you wanna have unstoppable confidence, self-love, and motivation, check out my 254 series. They're free. The links to join are in the description below. I really think mindset is everything, and so you've gotta really decide, are you gonna be positive about things or negative about things? Pause this video right now and ask yourself, am I doing my because of me? Then you're good, whether you're winning or losing. Or am I doing it because somebody else is telling me it's the right way? Or I'm subconsciously pandering to please somebody or something because I need the short-term stability. Figure that the out. I'm just like you, we're all the same. We all delegate, we all micromanage. The difference is, I don't think most things matter. When you look yourself in the mirror, what do you see and what do you say to yourself? Probably the most egotistical things that I say. I'm probably most egoed out when I'm talking to myself, which means that I've got a lot of confidence in ego. Mm. I, re- I really, whenever I talk to myself in the mirror, it's always the same thing, which is like, you're gonna f- do it, man. You're, you're f- man, you're good. Like, like, it's real good stuff. And it's not like false pumping up. I only do it seven times a year. <clears throat> but like something would have just happened either adversely or Mm -hmm. something great and I'll look myself and say, "Mm -hmm. Mm. we got this. I got a funny, Kevin Durant walked off the field, uh, off the court the other day against the uh, Warriors and uh, it was a big game, day before the Super Bowl and they lost. It was the first time they played and the Warriors are having probably the greatest season of any basketball, right? And he did something that me and AJ took note of. He kind of shook his head and said, okay, yeah. And he gave me that like, okay, you won, but we'll see you. And we got a shot. I got this. Right. And it was, that's what I do with myself. Like mm. if something good or bad's happening, I'll look myself in the mirror and, be, and I'll just say, mm-hmm. Mm. Like I know I'm built for this. Do you feel like you judge yourself? I don't. That's a very, very, very good observation. And it's what I want for everybody else. We're beating ourselves up. Like everybody sucks at something, right? Like we all have shortcomings. And we all have strengths. And for me, it's like, why don't we just audit that? Like, why don't we just look at it that way and be like, all right, well, I'm good at this, but I'm not good at that. Like, and then, and then, and then I only focus what I'm good at, right? Like, I don't dwell that I can't fix shit around the house. I call somebody to fix it. Like, I'm not like, I'm not a man. I don't give a fuck. Like, you know, like, like, you know, like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, we all, like, I also think it's awesome that I'm so emotionally stable and I'm the emotional backbone of everybody. Is that what a dude's supposed to do? Like, like these cliches, these stereotypes, they're so silly. Um, you're exactly right, man. I don't judge myself. I'm fully in love with myself. But I'm also fully in love with everybody else too, right? It's not like, like, it goes both ways. Like, I tell people to buy into me that work for me, it's because I buy into them first. Like, I don't need anybody to gain trust with me. I, it's there. Like, I believe that the human race is so grossly underrated. We are good. Of course we have some bad. There's seven billion of us. But like, when you look at our net score, it's bonkers shit. Like, do you know how much damage we could be doing to each other on an hourly basis and we don't? Like, we're still here. Like we won, we're the alpha being and we've figured out how to stay together. This is insane when you think about it. And yet everybody wants to dwell on like somebody said something mean. And you don't think it's possible to to, to grow the entrepreneur? I do. I think it's possible to grow anything. I think that I could be a better singer in three years. I think that I could be a better basketball player. 
do I think I can become Beyonce and LeBron even if I started at six years old? No, I do not. Yeah, that's right. And so, it, but it, but you have a better chance of being an entre- a master entrepreneur than a master basketball player. I don't know. I don't know uh-huh. is how I answered uh-huh. that. I do think that salesmanship and organizational understanding and reverse engineering and pattern recognition is absolutely a talent. And I think, Grant, it's funny you ask me that. I think we in the world have accepted music and sports as a pure play talent. And I think entrepreneurship is something we think everybody has. And I do think everybody can. And by the way, I think it's phenomenal to go from working at a job and not being on your own rules to making a business that makes $89,000 a year, but you get to do it your way. In a world where people need to be more practical, meaning not everybody's gonna be a millionaire. It's just the truth, the data's against you. But it is phenomenal to live a life where you get to make the rules and you make enough money to live your life. 5149, I would run a 51, I'd run a slash, and I'd run a 49. What's that mean? It would mean that I wanted to give everybody that ever came across me 51% of the value. And that's how I live my life. I so know what to do with the 49 that I wanna give 51. It's leverage, Mm. It's, um, it's how I think about it, it makes me feel good, I love being liked. I, Lewis, look, you and I run in similar circles and around a lot of different things. You know, you know what I'm about to say is so true and I'm very proud of this and I am saying this because I want everybody to hear it. Do you know how nice it feels for me to know that anybody that you talk to when my name gets brought up that knows me even a little bit thinks I'm great mm-hmm. and only the people that don't, don't? Like whatever I have in hate or they don't believe the hype or what's he really about, they just don't know me. Yeah. And anybody that spent any amount of time, like, and listen, there could be moments in time, but I know that the 137 times I've been brought up in different cocktail parties or things like that, that you, you've rarely heard from somebody who's interacted with me negative. Right. It's always been positive, right, right. and I love that. Yeah. And that's 5149, man. You can't be all time if you didn't have results. Yeah, you yeah, can't just yeah, say you're yeah. one of the greats. I yeah. can't say I'm one of the greatest badminton players of all time if I didn't do it. Yeah, 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 First you yeah. have to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the way he or she does that is by putting themselves in the best position to succeed. I met a kid last night, business went from zero to five million dollars in sales in two minutes. All Instagram, all the shit I spewed, I saved his life, he's the, I'm the best. I'm 27, Gary, I'm high energy, I'm just like you, and by the time I'm 30, I'm gonna be a billionaire. I stopped him. Mm-hmm. I said, why are you even doing that? First of all, you're probably not. Because you're 27, you got five million, and I don't see anything that gets you to a billion in your behavior right now. Number two, you pulled off a f- unbelievable thing, and you're downplaying your success because you're telling smart people like me you're gonna hit a billion in 30, and in three years I'm gonna see you, and you're not gonna hit a billion, and you've put, set yourself for a loss. And most of all, and this is why I'm telling this story, if you truly are convincing yourself that you're gonna hit a billion by the time you're 30, and you're at five million from zero at 27, and you're not gonna pull it off, all your behavior for the next 36 months is gonna be predicated on short-term behavior, not long-term behavior. And the best way to make real money, wealth, mm-hmm. not being rich, is to do things for the long-term because his life continues at 31. I think that too many people, when somebody says something they don't like to hear, dismiss it as hate and a troll. I read it and question it and then decide is there any merit to it. And the reason I've been able to evolve is because I don't just default if somebody disagrees with me or makes fun of me that they're wrong, I try to be thoughtful about what are they doing. Nine out of 10 times, it's because they're in a bad place and they're just trying to drag me down. But occasionally there's a point there that I kind of fester in and, and start subconsciously adjusting what I'm doing. Feedback is important. So one of my favorite Gary V um, answers was when asked what you would do if your daughter, when she turns 14, uh, goes into her room and is filming all her videos and nobody likes it and she comes out and says, nobody in this world loves me. And your answer was, step your game up, I believe is the answer. <laughs> Tell us about that. The market is the market, man. Like, 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 you know, if nobody's watching your stuff, like, it's not good enough. Like, everybody thinks their stuff is so good. Like, every day, Gary, my Instagram's so on fire, it's so d- awesome. Why is nobody, like, why am I not gaining followers? Cause it's not awesome. <laughs> like, of course, like it's just back to the same. Like you've seen it. You all have, all have friends and be like, "Look how cute my kid is," and you're like, "Ugh," <laughs> you know. Like, like it's what we think. We all think our stuff is the best, and like I get that. 
But yeah, that would be my advice only because that also is liberating. Mm. Like, pe- like to me, everything's about breathing, right? Like to me, everything is about like take full ownership for everything and then everything gets easy because then you're in control. And then learn how to love to lose. Like for me, my game's simple, right? It's all my fault. So now, I'm not mad at Lindsay or D-Rock or, that's it, my fault. I'm empowering them. So it's actually true. My fault. Now, oh, we lost this or this didn't deliver or we f***ed up. All right, it's an L. Like everybody's got losses. You know, it's funny, uh, when UFC started getting popular, I started using it to paint the picture. I'm like, look, business and entrepreneurship is much more UFC than it is boxing. In boxing, a loss is devastating. Like, you know, if you ever, you know, if you're, I'm a big boxing fan, like most big fights, like the big, big, big fights through the year, almost, it's just unbelievable amounts of 33 and 0 versus 35 and 0, right? Just like, uh, that's like what you do, you don't fight anybody, and you get to that level. Everybody's got losses in the UFC. And so, I think that's how, that's how entrepreneurship, that's how life is, we all have losses. And so, I like losses. I love adversity. I like the climb. I like the chip on my shoulder. I like when people are like, oh, I knew it. He's not that good. That is like, like I'm even weirdly scared as I continue to ascend and I'm getting popular and what, I, what did you say, the marketing, leading, like people start putting these words in front of my name. I'm like, am I gonna sabotage myself to like recorrect this? Like, I like adversity. So, yeah, all on me. You know, I enjoy losses. Now all of a sudden, like what? You become completely invincible. I feel invincible. I really genuinely, outside of the health of myself and 20 people, feel 100% invincible as a person. There are gonna be times where naturally, it fe- right now I'm in the, a phase in my health, in working out, especially after I really severely sprained my ankle, where over the last four years, I'm probably at the heaviest, I've got the most fat, that I've had in four years, and for the last three months, I've just not been in the same zone that I've been for the last four years. I'm dealing with it by not overjudging myself. And so, things ebb and flow. Like right now, you're in massively good physical <laughs> shape. I mean, you just are, I'm impressed. I did biceps today, so. <laughs> I'm impressed. But I, I'm sure you intuitively understand there'll probably be a chapter where you won't be as tight on your regimen and what have you. The way, you know, I'm very fascinated by the conversation of work ethic, hustle, overworking. I'm fascinated by people's ability to not take on accountability. I I never feel like my points of view and my thoughts and my hot takes and my passions and my story are right. I've never believed that in my life. I don't think they're right. I think I enjoy sharing them because I enjoy sharing them. I'm a communicator. There's some selfish needs of communicating, I'm sure. But like, I share them. But everybody shares them. This thought that, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things we need to get more thoughtful about is this question, which is, the answer to the question is by conversating with yourself and trying to develop self-awareness and not look for outside validation. When people email me and say, Gary Vee, I've been hustling 15 hours a day. I'm like, you getting enough rest? You good? Are you, like, are you pumped? Like, with intention, my intention is to be happy. And so I'm not gonna apologize for enjoying my work. Talk about like society wrapped up in vanity, like of social. If you are a high school guy who's a nerd, but you get a blue check from Instagram, You're- your life changed. Change. You get any girl you want. The amount of people that send me things like, I will rip my arm off (laughs) if you can help me get verified on Instagram. Like, literally things like, I will sell you my children (laughs) if you get me verified on, like, I will give you my home. It's crazy. And live in a cardboard box. And I'm just like, this is the saddest shit ever. Mm-hmm. And, and, and a lot of my content in the last six months has been like, please do not get wrapped up in likes and, you know, your rank in the podcast list mm-hmm. or checks, like that is such a death game. You will lose that mm-hmm. game. You will start pandering to those results versus actual results. By creating a great product consistently. New York yeah. Times bestseller list. Yeah. I don't pander to that. I don't want to hire the companies that get mm-hmm. me on the list. I want to sell more books. Yeah. That's the KPI. Impact more people. That's even the bigger KPI. But look, I mean, the world has always traded on I mean, you know, do you know how sad at this point I am when I'm on these 30, no, I'm not 30, excuse me, like top 40 influencers mm-hmm. or 
50 under 50 now, which is the only thing I can, <laughs> can you know, now 40. 42. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, you know, I hate it because my feed gets filled up with like congratulations or the other people that are on it trying to get me into a conversation. Not because I, I kudos to them because I was the most pumped too when I was like 10 most important people in the wine business under 40. Like amazing, mm-hmm. I get it. But it's, as you get older, you realize how those awards or those like just completely arbitrary things of like mm. an editor liked one of your podcasts right. and decided, and we all get excited. Yeah. Like six best podcasts to listen in 2018. You want to be a part of that. You want awareness. Here's what I would say. We've overcorrected a lot of people into caring about that more than the actual results. And so we care more about the facade than we care, we care more about like, look how nice my room, like this, we're in a beautiful room right now, mm. right? You've really done a nice job with nice. this. Yeah. I like how you put like the more important people on their own like, <laughs> like wall over here. That's well, they were just bigger photos. No, so no, 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 you it. made them bigger. I know you. But, <laughs> but here's what's interesting to me. What's interesting is if the concrete and steel under this building is shit, well, this whole thing falls. So it didn't course. matter that you put some like tree. How pretty it is, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think right now, too many entrepreneurs and personalities and people, 98% of the people that are listening to this podcast right now mm-hmm. are caring about the decorations and the curtains and the painting in the room, not the steel and the concrete holding up the room. And I think that that's an important conversation mm-hmm. to be had. I think a lot of what makes me happy and work for me has been the steel and the concrete. Mm. Where you end up in your, you know, your career is going to be predicated on many things and talent is one of them. Your ambition is another circumstance. Mm-hmm. You know, all of us, if we have a tragic event, check out. Right. Like there's a million variables yep. in life, but take away lot luck. Like, you know, you, do you know that I do not play the lottery cuz I'm scared to win? You're scared to win. I do not play the lottery. Okay. Because I'm scared to win because then everybody will say that it was the lottery ticket that enabled me to do the things I'm planning on doing in the next 50 years. No entrepreneur can be successful with somebody who is not independent. None. There's no a entrepreneur. Partner. That's right. Yeah. No Sally, if her husband Rick is not independent and can't keep himself busy and isn't about his life, she can't do what she needs to do because he's gonna be pulling her at all times and making her feel guilty for taking that extra business trip, for looking at the phone during dinner. And so you need, if you're a true bred entrepreneur, an obsessed entrepreneur, and what I mean by that is, I believe, I know your audience, I know mine, I believe 87% of the people listening right now are in it for the money. Mm -hmm. They're in it for the short term, get the money, go on the nice vacations, right? Buy the nice car. If you're part of the 13%, that I'm a part of, which is you would die tomorrow if somebody said you couldn't play. I, I would much rather make $100,000 a year, and I proved this, this is what I did in my, from 22 to 34, I made 150, 130, 167, 49,000 dollars a year building my dad's business for him. I never got upset that I had no equity. I don't have resentment that I left that business at 34 with nothing. I, even when people say to me, don't listen to Gary, his daddy put him on or gave him the business, when I know the true story is, I didn't get anything. I just built a monster business for my dad in my best years of my youth and then left and started over, right? Mm. I mean, VaynerMedia started with me getting a client to pay because I had no money to pay mm. me and AJ or anybody yeah. else. For the 13% who are listening, they get it, which is like, look, no question, I think a lot of people are like bullshit if they don't know me, but if you know me, make $14 million a year, right, uh, and not be able to play anymore, mm. passive income. Make 200000 a year and get able to play, I'm not even close. It's 200000 in play. I'll suffocate, I'll suffocate. You mean I'm like why? a fish out of water if I'm not building a business. Mm. Every moment of my life since 1987 has been unbelievably passionately, 98% of my human energy against the notion of either my family or building the business that's in my hands at the time. Baseball cards, liquor store, you know, my personal brand, VaynerMedia, the investments I've made, uh, selling a book. I'm always in project mode operating. I've, you know, from the day I started working, I've been running a company. In, becoming Gary Vee and all that stuff, there's never been a day where, where Gary Vee has been my business. Every day. Since May of 1998, I've been running Wine Library or VaynerMedia, all of them. Every single day in continuum. So, yeah, I mean, to me, 
if you're that, if you're one of those 13%, for all the 13% that are listening, if you're still not married, or by the way, if you're married, you may want to consider divorce. I'm being really serious here, because you're not doing yourself a favor and you're not doing your partner a favor. If you are not blindly supported, you will suffocate and die. It will not work. Mm. It, it just will not work. And I think for some people, the come up's easier and the level up's harder. For other people, it's the reverse. For me, you know what? It's gonna be a fun recall. The same guy who works the room with the same level of humility and deep passion to meet people and help them and help himself if serendipitously he stumbles into an opportunity, uh, who loves to co-sign and watch people shine and like, why not? Who likes to like add to that, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, Is it, is the same guy today that was seven years ago and that's the same with me with wine techs, tops. Like I'm pretty much navigating the same exact business blueprint that got me here and I'm a more mature version. Mm -hmm. I'm in the subtleties much better than I used to be but at its core, like what, you know a lot of times you hear the saying, you know, what got you here is what you need to double down on and then you hear contradictions like you gotta change up now that you're at the next level. I think people make those things absolute. Here's how I see it. I'm, I'm tripling down on what got me here but I'm maturing and evolving around the edges and changing certain things. More mature, more thoughtful, not making the same mistakes um, and uh, exper- you know, experienced I- Gary it should be better than rookie Gary. Unless it's complete death blow, death to me and my 17 people that I give a shit about, like everything else is super secondary. And let me tell you something, if you actually get into that mindset, it gets real good. Like everybody like makes these big deals out of things that just don't matter. It's perspective. You know, my selfishness comes from my selflessness. Like it's what makes me feel good. I see it in my mother. My mom is the epicenter to every single person in her life. Her sister-in-law, her you know, cousins, aunts, everybody goes to her. That's her comfort zone, me too. Ask Gary Vee, like, like this is my comfort zone, like I like this. Like I hate when people are like, what can I do for you? Like I, I say nothing, I don't want anything. I hate that feeling. I went into my family business because I felt like I owed it to like pay them back. Those are my parents. So if that's what I feel about them, what do you think I think about everybody else? There's a really interesting thing that an entrepreneur that she or he needs to be able to manage a lot of things, which is, I'll use this analogy, TD. This is the easiest way I can put it. Some people really just want to juggle three balls and they do it and nothing falls and they're like, look. And I'm like, cool, that's amazing. I'm gonna juggle 25 plates. Nine of them are gonna break, (laughs) right? But but I'm 16 to your three. And because I actually don't care about judgment, because where people, the reason a lot of people don't do things is, look, Empathy, which is a wine brand that I launched. I come from the wine business. I'm building a machine that's building brands. And if Empathy fails, that's like a big L. And like, like could really like slow me down if somebody's thoughtfully looking at me, but I'm okay with that L. And I think what you need to do is have a stomach to be able to have losses. Have you had any losses? Plenty. Plenty. Okay. You know, when we started VaynerMedia, I also launched two other companies, Corked and Forest. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of things I invest in, Incubate. Um, wh- here's, wh- here's, here's where things... Failure is part of the game. It has to be. And, and here's where people need clarity on this. Micro failures. Right. Right, not, 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 the, not, the, major, <laughs> not the major And ones. this is where people get confused. I lose millions of, I, over the last 10 years of my career, I've probably lost millions of dollars every year on a failure, but nothing. You're making, you're making me feel real good right now, Bobby. But, no, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. the reason I'm making you feel good and I don't have the details on where you're going with that is, but it didn't put you out of business. It right. didn't cha- you know, you didn't have to go and be Rocky Five and go back to like right, the, you know. I think that when it's all said and done, and we've been talking a lot about legacy, that when it's all said and done, You've achieved greatness when even though all along the way there was a narrative of he's a dick Mm. or he'll never pull it off or what has he ever really done. Greatness is when you are on that last day, both the fans and the non-fans have to accept and acknowledge the results. Hunger is a really interesting thing. You know, hunger is an interesting thing because when you're hungry, when you get an opportunity, you tend to overgorge. When I think back, is like. Real I, quick on this. Yeah. It's a really important analogy that I've never really, I've thought about, but I've never said out loud. When you're hungry and you get to a buffet, you throw up. Hmm. 
And so when, when people are hungry for success and they get in front of me or anybody else or an opportunity, they overeat. Truth. I know. It's fast. And I know you get it. I do get it. And I think that you're eating a couple less plates now at your yeah. at-bats and that's why things are happening. I have definitely suffocated excuses better than a lot of people, Mm -hmm. which is really the biggest reason so many people who are listening right now are not winning. They are surrounded by people that are willing to accept their excuses on one very interesting insight. It's because those people don't give a Your friends and your family are letting you get away with your excuses because they don't care. I weirdly don't know you and I care. And let me tell you how to fix this. Get your excuses out of your mouth. What's super interesting is, and those people that are CFOs and CEOs and COOs, they think that's the magic. I always laugh at them. I'm like, you're a commodity. There's millions of you. That's math. That's easy to understand. I I always say, if you want to be an anomaly, you have to act like one. Like people want all these special things to happen, but then they're acting like everybody else. And that gets into the Saturdays on in your 20s, like, or or just like taking risks or things of that nature, like. I totally agree with you. I, I think about it as, you know that picture where like it looks like two people kissing or it looks like a glass of champagne? Mm. Like I just basically think at this point in my business life, the world sees the glass of champagne and I see the two people kissing. Like I just can see it. Like I know what's coming. I think that people need to try to be self-aware about what makes them happy and doesn't make them happy. Right now, social me- I view social media as a, as a mirror. I think what people are putting out is an incredible indicator of what's inside of them. So right now there's a lot of political anxiety, there's a lot of ideological anxiety, and so what we're seeing is a lot of judgment. You know, I think you know the early days, especially when you and I were on it, like there was a lot of Nirvana early users. It was very soft. I think you are seeing um, a different version of that today, but that is, you know. <laughs> Getting off of social is no different than stop watching CNN or Fox every night or reading the Journal or the Times. Um, We consume as animals. And I think if one feels overwhelmed, they should stop consuming. But I don't put social media consumption in a very different place than the films and music and, and books that one reads. Like, the collective replies of people's angst is no different than Kurt Cobain's singular angst, other than it's a collective versus a singular. And so I think it's great. And like when people are like, oh, like, like what are you gonna think about that? I'm like, I don't care about social media. Mm-hmm. I really don't. I care about humans communicating with each other. I'm fascinated by communication, and I'm fascinated that we now have a collective ability to communicate at a scale that we've never seen before. And I think right now people are focusing on the downside of that and I think we're forgetting the upside of it. There's so much love and greatness going on every day. I think humans find what they're looking for. If you're signing into Twitter to find a fight or to find somebody to fight with or to see some negativity, you're gonna find it. I think if you go to Twitter or Instagram to find happiness and positivity, it's there at scale. That's just, karma is practical. I love how people think karma is like this weird thing. Doing good for other people is a good strategy. <laughs> like, I, I, like it's like, uh, you know, I've been like trying to, I'm like, why does this thing even exist? It's actually the most common sense thing of all time. Why does karma seem weird? The f- is karma? Like, wait a minute, so you're telling me like, if you do lots of good things, that weirdly good things happen to you? Yeah, that seems like common sense. <laughs> when are the moments that you doubt yourself the most because I know you're extremely confident in yourself, but are there moments and what are, what are they and how do you get through it when you have that doubt in anything you're doing? One of the weird things I do is I don't, I'm in a funny place now where I'm not putting myself in a place where I doubt myself. And so I always wonder is that like not challenging myself or is that like staying in my lane? But like I will tell you like the only thing I think about being, like when you ask me like what's scary, here's reading in public is scary. It's terrifying. Because I can't read. <laughs> yeah. Even like the last time I did the Ask Gary V book, like for the audio book. You I was just like, kind of riff. Well, you know what's funny? I always do that. Yeah. Uh, Cause I get bored. Cause mm-hmm. I'm, that's why I got F. So I'm like, I don't want to read my own. Like, you know, I'm like this. I know what's in here. Like, okay, you know. <laughs> that's why people buy the book and the audio book. Cause they're like basically not even the same. Yeah. Uh, it was fun actually for me. Cause I'm like, oh, I'm a better reader than I've gotten. You know, I think I've been forced to read so much over the last 10 years as we became a computer based, mm-hmm. email based, text based mm-hmm. world. Um, but uh 
I don't like to, like I would be, if you were like, hey, read my notes here right now to the podcast, I'd be like, you can literally ask me to get naked. I'm like, all right, well, f- it. But if you said read this right it's now terrifying. verbatim, I'm like, ugh, because I'm, I don't like that. Uh, but man, it's, then it's things like, a tr- like throw me in a pit of snakes. I'm like, I don't want that. Right. Like jump off this building. That. But there's you nothing know, in business that, in business, that makes yeah. you doubt yourself. <laughs> yeah. there, is there a situation that you could see? Like you've spoken in front of 50,000 people. No. That's not I've scary. Is there the, at this point in my career, I've been in the room with everybody. And yeah. that means I have not been in a room with a ton of people, but like every All the staff, big leaders, I've every billionaire, with, that's every right, CEO. That's right. I'm of the cloth. Yeah. I, I belong. You're and confident to be, too, yeah. I'll be very frank with you. I think I'm better. I think when it's all said and done, I win this generation. I think Elon and Zucks and the Uber guys, I think a ton of people make more money. I'm convinced now that nobody will make more money, nobody will make more money and help people make more money than me in this generation. I will win. In that game, yeah. In the game of that I like, yes. which is winning personally and winning helping other people. I don't think I'm gonna be touched. I think mm-hmm. I will be the guy. I think they will go back and be like, look, here were the people that were entrepreneurs during a time when entrepreneurship was cool, and here are all the different things. Elon invented the craziest shit. And the, you know, Mark Zuckerberg created the greatest, and Bezos created the best companies and made mm-hmm. the most money. And then Gary did the best job of making a, the most money, and he bought the Jets, and that became symbolic, but he also created millions of 100,000 heirs and millionaires mm-hmm. That's what Crush It's about. Yeah, like, and that's why it, Crushing yeah. It's about. I think that's really cool. I spend an enormous amount of time trying to make my audience awesome out of the selfishness of the legacy, mm. not to get them into a top of the funnel to buy my book or my sneaker. Right, right. I ask for it, but I have zero vulnerability or expectation. Talk to me about how your mom played into that, because a ton. So I know your mom, you've credited her with really helping to build your self-esteem, but you're also a huge believer in like, don't fool yourself, don't tell yourself you're good at something you're not. So how did she make you feel so good about yourself? She walked, struggling. that's a great, great, that's a very, you're doing a good job here. Thank you, sir. That's a very, no, it's a very good way to ask it, because the truth is, she strategically used bullshit and real. What I think, in hindsight, she did, was she overemphasized things that were subjective or good. So she really, I'll I'll never forget this. I opened the door for a woman in McDonald's in Edison, New Jersey, literally, like when I was eight. Just, you know, we were both walking with a little head and I opened it and let her walk through. If I tell you that my mom basically treated that event like I won the Nobel Peace Prize (laughs) for like three weeks, but think about how smart that is. Like think about how reinforcing that played out. Played out so much that one of the most interesting comments in the 250 blogs that I've done was I got uh, an email from somebody who said, hey Gary Vee, you know, <laughs> this, is, this comes like, hey at first I thought like eh, you know, and then I got into it a little bit and I was watching this vlog and then the other day you really, you nailed it home. And I'm like, you know, I'm reading, I'm like I can't wait to see what I did. <laughs> He's like, you went into the elevator and you let all your employees go first. And you know, it's just so interesting, right? These subtle little things, it's important, it's so fascinating what matters to people. And I get it, like I actually think that's right, but it's so weaving into me at this point, I don't even, I don't recognize that. Um, that's what she did well. She made, she made big deals out of the things that were tried and true. And then, and then when I got D's and F's, she punished me. Even though she knew I didn't need school in her heart, she made me know that there was accountability for things. So I would lose television and video game and friends privileges for, it would always be for a month. She'd break down somewhere around day 14, 13. (laughs) My sister would tattle on me when I would sneak in TV. It was a funny, it was a sitcom in itself, the three of us. Um, she, uh, she, She really made me feel special, man. She really did it right. She really, really, really pounded home my EQ, my kindness. I've done it with Xander too. Uh, He went to the playground when he was two. We were at the playground. A little three-year-old kid falls and skids his knee and he walked over and was like, are you okay? And I made that like a two-week thing, Mm. right? Like empathy, right? And so so she she just really did a good job of making me feel good about the things that were around my kindness and 
my support of my sister and my leadership skills of my friends and taking the, you know, I took a bullet once for something my friend did in the neighborhood and she thought that was a good thing and just, just kind of those personality traits that I think, you know, if, we all, if all of us, everybody watching, wrote down like personality traits that we admire, anytime I showed any uh, of those actions, she drove them home and I think modern day parents and most parents do not do that. I think they focus on dumb sh- like grades uh, because they are insecure and they want to put the bumper sticker that their kid went to you know, Stanford. Like it's real f-ed up when you really think about what's actually happening. Um, so much of it is misery loves company or people reflecting of what's inside of them. So that's my punchline, which is like good behavior is in perpetuity. I do believe in the modern internet to create awareness for something you want, whether that's to raise money for a nonprofit or to sell glasses. I believe the volume of content is, because then you're able to contextualize it to your audience, is absolutely the leverage of the current state of consumer consumption. Um, One's capability, financially, energy-wise, creatively, you know, but it's no different than saying run really fast. If you can run really, really fast, faster than anybody, you can win an Olympic gold medal and then make $25 million a year in sponsorship if that's what you choose or live in a cave and say, I won a gold medal. I'm, I'm speaking to what I genuinely believe is the right strategy. You know, how one interprets that you know, is really up to them. Once in a blue moon, I come up with very tangible advice. So I, I've been talking a lot about leaving comments in people's Instagram posts, but not like follow me or like just to game it, no, take the out. You wanna grow your, everyone's like, how do I grow? I'm like, there's a way. It's called the thank you economy. Uh-huh. Quietly go in like nice and calmly. Like if you're a photographer, go to Nick's page. He's got legit shit. He takes a photo of some pretty person, boy or girl, he's very good at that, in some beautiful setting. And like, look at it and then leave a comment that's meaningful. Like, hey Nick, you know, are you using this filter or I noticed what you did with the light there? Like something that means something, not like cool or lit. You know, like you're not leaving the comment for the sake of leaking the comment. Mm-hmm. You're taking the actual hour and a half to like look, add something of value. You do that on, on you know, 90 different, and the way I came up with it was leave your two cents, you know, in a comment, leaving your two cents. Go take nine hashtags that are relevant to your business and then go to 10 accounts or, to, or 10 hashtags, top nine. It used mm-hmm. to be the top now. Right. Now it's just random nine. Yeah. So to pick 10 hashtags, the random nine, that's 90, leave two cents. Now you've left a dollar 80 for the day. Yeah. Watching the last two, three, four, five, six weeks of people like, you know, cause it's funny, right? People are buying likes and comments. People are like trying to do dumb shit, give away iPads or Yeezys or off-whites to get followers. Or you can actually work for an hour. Add value. Know your craft and yeah. add, like Nick for, I'm actually looking at it like, do you know what would happen because he actually knows his craft if he actually spent three hours a day? Three hours is a lot of time. It's a lot of time, but, yeah. And if he gave a fuck, and I don't think he should or shouldn't, right. but if he gave a fuck, the fact that if he spent three hours looking at 20 hashtags in photography because he's crafted and skilled and gifted and went to those people's photos and said shit that I would never understand. I'd just be like, nice thong or like nice muscles or like cool coconuts. <laughs> like, but if he said like, oh shit, I see what you did there off the reflection horizon, you know. Right. Well, that matters because like people see that you're leaving something meaningful, right? For me, stumbling into the talent, the natural talent, uh, that, that very nice bio, what I realized from having, and this might sound very interesting and it took me a long time to realize it, the reason I had eight lemonade stands, and I did, the reason I had eight lemonade stands as a child, which is absurd and very unique, is on a stage like this actually five years ago, I'm giving the story, I used to give my bio more, and it, I actually remembered for the first time why was I doing that? Because I was starting to get a little bit um, upset with myself, was I lazy and just wanted my friends to work? But what I was actually doing as a six-year-old kid, as a six-year-old child, I was walking, the 1980s in America was much more safe, so I was walking about in the neighborhood and I was looking at the cars driving and trying to figure out where to put my lemonade stand sign on which tree or which post of a sign. And basically, 37 years later, right here, right now, I'm still doing the same thing. 
I've been chasing the attention of human beings to figure out where they're paying attention and then I spend the rest of my time trying to make a sign that's gonna make them stop and buy my lemonade. Would you borrow money? Would you borrow money? Well, I borrow money now because there's make- no interest on it. Huh? Money's great right now. It's a- the problem is yeah, it's yeah. the same old game, right? Which is, it's the same thing around the lottery. It's the same thing about all these things. It's, get, it's tough for us, and I'm sure you deal with this. Yeah. I, I struggle with giving advice because I need more context. If you're an f- idiot, you shouldn't borrow money because you're gonna yeah. go way worse. You know, like, like, well, like. Well, what's the difference? You're gonna be broke either way. You're an idiot. Why not borrow the money? So, so look, it depends on how you borrow money. Here, yeah, let me, yeah, let yeah. me give you a real yeah. good idiot play. Student loans. Yeah. That's the most idiot. Yeah, yeah. Because that you can't get out of. That's one of my questions. Okay, Go ahead. college. Go ahead. College. College. Hate it. Hate it, right? Or entrepreneurs. Yeah. If you need. How much money will you make this year? I will make. What, what, what are you gonna pay taxes on? What number will you pay taxes probably on? Probably 17. Yeah, okay. 17 million. Right, he's gonna make 17 million. Is your best year? It's gonna be your best year? Yes. So, so, and he's telling you don't go to college. Did you finish? Yes, but I went to Mount Ida College. Yeah, I went to Magnet State University. This, this is how, you give this how money, by the way, this, how I got, this is how I got to Mount Ida College. I got a postcard in the mail in March of my senior year of high school and my mom finally woke up and realized, I had, like she didn't know the process, yeah. she was an immigrant. And she's like, you're going to college. And I'm like, no, mom, I didn't. I like, didn't apply for anything. She's like, you're going to college. I'm like, crap, all right. And then a postcard came. Yeah. I filled it out. And that's how I went to Mount Ida College. Yeah. What'd you study there? <laughs> Madden 94. <laughs> There's only offense and defense. There's only the force and the dark side. Right? And I think that um, right now people are, are, a lot of people are choosing to be driven by fear and negativity without realizing it. And so if you're listening right now, my biggest thing is start leaning into a little bit more of optimism and positivity. I think where it overcorrects is when it goes into delusion and that's when you start creating entitlement and that is the tightrope that I've been talking about, thinking about, watching. Um, and it's, I, I create entitlement a lot of times because I like positivity mm. and it took me a little while, maybe 20 or 30 years, 20 years of operating and managing and parenting and being like, okay, <laughs> I, I can see this, but I'm, not, but I'm a product of not having entitlement. You talk a lot about you know, delayed gratification and there's time and everyone has a lot of time and people are wanting things right now. What do you think, even with that mentality, I know that you would love to get results, bigger results all the time with what you're doing. You know, if you sell 100,000 books, right. you would like to sell 200,000 books right now. And, That's and, you exactly know, right. Right, what? Micro, micro, yeah. macro. Yes, exactly. That's it. But what do you think you're gonna need to do to step into getting faster results? In the micro and the macro, um, what would take you to the next level I think quicker? What ta- I think what takes everybody to the next level is cutting out dumb shit. Like what, if you really look at anything, it's always cutting. So what Jack Welsh had such a great career, he was so right in like, when it was a revolutionary thought of like, cut your bottom 10% of your staff each year. But it's right. I mean like, no question, whether in your training, in your business, in your friendships, do you understand that if every person who's listening right now started to weed off the friend that is bringing the least value, and I mean they're a bad influence, they're, they're, they're bad mojo, they're bad, mm-hmm. like and bad. I mean, they're just negative, they're a negative person so they're dragging you down, they're selfish, uh, they have bad habits like a drug addiction or something. And you don't wanna leave them, ha- I wanna make sure people, people right. when they hear me say this, like, <clears throat> oh, you get rid of your friend, no. Just, if you audit your circle of who you spend time with, if you just spent less time with something that is broken and you added one person that was incredibly, yeah valuable, your life would be a lot better. That's just real. What is the impact that you want to have on the world? So I would say this is my current POV. Because I think it's actually important that I have a different answer for this at 50 and 60 because you're gonna adjust to the reality. I'll give you a good example. If something terrible happens in my life and it's disease based or it's because some kid was texting while he was driving and hit my dad, those will become things that I want to leave a legacy about because that's just how we act as humans, right? They become your truths. But no question, this will never go away. I want to do the following. I'm fascinated by the same thing that attracts so many of millions of people to people that are selling bullshit. Those same people are attracted to me. 
And what I want to do is suffocate out all those other people and become the alpha of that entire world of people that are, are hoping and are desperate to look at me and what I want to do is inspire two 14 year old girls in Kansas City right now to build a billion dollar company on having a bunch of employees hugging each other in the halls. I think that Steve Jobs came along, became an icon, but the sad part of that narrative was he did not treat his employees well. He became an icon and the narrative became he got the most out of people by being a jerk and that became romanticized and a lot of people in Silicon Valley today run companies where they're mean because they think that's the right thing to do because they put Steve Jobs on a pedestal. I want my pedestal moment, I want to become that big and what I want to come from that is that kids that aren't even born today think that they can build a $5 billion company and be a great guy or a great gal. I want to build the biggest building in town ever by just building the biggest building in town while I think most people try to tear down everybody else's building. So I think positivity and good is practical advice to building an empire and I want to be the poster child of the person that built the biggest, baddest empire and did it by being a good dude along the way. And not everybody's gonna be happy about everything I did, but if it's 97% of people talking good behind your back, that's a real legacy. And I wanna do it in a pop culture way. I'm gonna do it anyway. People have done that before. Just so you know, there's plenty of people. Warren Buffett's a really good dude. Like there's plenty of people that have done that. There's a difference. I wanna do it and I wanna be a rock star, right? Like, and that's where you influence people. Like, you know, like I wanna do it but I also wanna be the most popular. And so then that person's like, oh, I wanna be him, so I guess I'll be nice. Like I wanna literally take people who have DNA that's kind of nice and make them more nice because they think that's how I became big. So I basically wanna trick the business world into becoming kinder. When you started trying to care towards me Mm -hmm. as your career evolved over the last nine years, the first four times that you cared, I thought, this is the setup for the other thing. The ask or something, right? Because that's what we as humans think. Mm -hmm. That is the environment we live in. I'm sure that's what people feel about me. Mm -hmm. The fact that you, look, I think here's here's the thing. Actually, let me say this about you as well. This is a good topic. I want to pay forward at all costs. I want to give, give, Mm -hmm. give, 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 right? Jab, 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 right hook. Like if I had it my way, that book would have been called jab, 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 right hook. I think the thing that you have, that I have, and this is our kinship and no question yeah. speaks to our success, is we're very willing to give. Yeah. We're not as scared to ask for something in return, but we are not crippled. We don't overreact to somebody coming through and we're not crippled when they don't. Right. I'll give you a great example for everybody listening. When School Greatness came out, you know, like, you know, you emailed, you reached out, I was able to buy a bunch of books, we did all the right things. When, when Mass came out, this feels like what, three months ago? Yeah. I remember this clearly because I kept like getting scared that I was f-ing up because you reached out, you're like, this is coming. But I had some shit going on just like business stuff. You were really like, busy too I was and just, everything, no, yeah. No, but I was just really like between yeah. personal life and business and I just remember like, cause I remember this cause I was like, oh shit, I gotta, like, you know, it wasn't like notes, I'm like, oh, I gotta reach out to him, I gotta, and then I like hit you up and I was like, dude, where, where are you? Like, you're like, dude, I was in New York four days ago. Like, but you know what's interesting to me? Mm-hmm. That. Because that's how I play. Like sometimes people will come through, sometimes they don't. Giving with expectation is a devastatingly bad idea that 99% of people do. Tell us the story about pulling flowers and reselling them. Yes, this is who I am. This is my DNA. The first business I ever had in my life, I would go around the neighborhood, I would pull people's flowers out of their yards, I'd ring their doorbell and sell it back to them. Dude, that's not, you know. It's not super, it's not super, it's not super ethical. This is why my dad has such a big impact on my life. When I turned 14 and got in my dad's business, the first thing he taught me was that. And it saved my ass. The same reason, uh, word word is bond. uh Word is bond, Uh word is bond, Uh and that's it. And it saved me because when you have this much level of charisma. What's that got to do with pulling the flower? I'll explain. Okay. It, It basically elevated into ethics. Uh, oh, God, got You know, it, like, got it, got it, it. it's even yeah, the spiel it, that I've been, look, look, I'm not confused that some of the things I'm spewing here are yeah, not yeah. exactly aligned with you or everybody else. It's what feels right to me, just like you do what feels yeah. right to you. Yeah, yeah. We all say what we say, and so, but what my dad did for me, when you have as much salesmanship and charisma and story capabilities as I do, uh-huh. this is just the truth. Yeah. You can manipulate, I can make anything happen. I can fundamentally make almost any human do anything. 
I'm being dead serious. Make me do something right now. I'll make, you, I'll make you do something without you knowing, and then I'll tell you the story of how it happened. Okay, I like that. <laughs> okay, good. So, so Wow, man, so, am I gonna like this? You're gonna love it. Okay, and okay. So, so what's interesting about that is, that's dangerous. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Well, Hitler, intent, that's if, if a cult. If the intent's bad. Correct, and I don't have bad intent, so I was gonna be okay. Yeah. What my dad did was speed up what I would've learned by becoming a wiser man. Mm-hmm. And so at a younger age, I became more straight and arrow and less full of shit and that helped me so much. Right, you grew up. If I didn't think of it as motivational and I thought of it as strategy, because mindset's strategy, mm-hmm. right? Like, like being insecure is a mindset. It was put into you for a million different reasons. Figuring out how to get out of that hole by who you surround with, how you think, what you do, if you, insecurity is the biggest poison in our lives. Like insecurity scares the fuck out of me. Lack of self-esteem is why people do everything bad buy dumb shit to make themselves feel better, do dumb shit, like take dumb shit and put it into their mm-hmm. body. It's all insecurity. Um, I used to remember in high school, back to dating now, it made me, I'm gonna tie these stories together. I, I remember when I realized, oh, my friends drink alcohol to get courage. Mm. But, but they don't even that <clears throat> drunk, they just use it as an excuse to do shit that they wanted to do anyway. It's just all insecurity, Mm -hmm. man. As far as failing, it's interesting. I don't have like a fantastic, obvious failure and that's actually a weakness because it's very grounded in my deep, deep, deep immigrant roots. I've never done anything that has so overextended myself that if it didn't work, that I would really fail. Where I've really failed is on the things that I haven't done. I've fantastically passed on Uber twice in the angel round and that $25,000 check would have made me $500 million. I fantastically didn't even reply to Air Bed and Breakfast's email to have, (laughs) which is what BNB stands for, uh, to invest in their company. I've passed on a lot of opportunities that have become fantastic. They're the most obvious. And And then the really biggest mistakes I've made is when I didn't come to a conference like Brilliant Minds over the last five or six years, and that would have been the conference when I met someone and she and I would have done something. So it's much more, when you're crippled by opportunity, it's the hidden things that you've passed on that are the great mistakes of your career. Uh, Especially when you're like me, who's not ever playing a financial arbitrage machine game where you're trying to slide one past the goalie and hope your timing's right. I'm a marathon runner in a sprinter's costume. And so I, I don't put myself in a position to be that vulnerable. Um, uh, the other thing is, in my, from, from 18 to 29, I worked every single day. All of them. And so I definitely think like one vacation a year for a week with my friends from high school or college would have been a good idea. <laughs> so I was just so passionate, I so wanted to, pay my parents back for being the greatest parents and bringing me to America, that I was obsessed with building that family business and I probably could have had a little bit more leisure in my 20s, which I regret. Not really, but yes. (laughs) You know what I mean? Not really, not because I became successful, honestly, because I just loved it. Like my, you know, I go garage sailing on the weekends, literally go to people's yards and try to buy things for a dollar that they're selling that was in their basement and then think, and then repost it on eBay for $8 and in that $7 ROI, get more excited than landing an $8 million client. So for me, business is my hobby. It's a, you know, and so that's why I say not really because I just loved it. I loved, you know, working the register on a Saturday when I was 25 years old because I love it. I believe one of the great ways to mix things up is what you listen to and who you surround yourself with. Um, I would, I'm unbelievably passionate about people finding more optimistic, practical friends. And I, and I think optimism gets, can, get, can slide into delusion, which is why I say optimistical, practical, you know? Uh, it's funny, as you were talking about minimalism, like I didn't, it, it's so interesting that you're the first person to ever say it to me that I can recall, and it feels very real to me. Like I don't have outside things kind of driving me, and that's what leads me to a lot of happiness. And so 
I would say auditing your circle. Like if somebody wants a meaning, meaningful life, live a meaningful life, live, just get happier. I think the people that you spend your time with is a big one. The amount of people listening right now who've got a mother who's super pessimistic and cynical, but they love their mother and they don't realize that cutting down their time from seven hours a week of engagement with their mother to two and adding, like going out of their way to seeing the person that's always smiling in the office and trying to spark up a friendship and become friends with that person and cutting up that seven hours a week from mom to two to mom, maybe 30 minutes with that person and maybe reallocating the other hours to themselves or other things is a massive deal. It's a massive deal. A word that has been really running through my head quite a bit over the last couple years is entitlement. Mainly because I have exploded on Instagram and I get 10,000 direct messages a week from kids who are wealthy, affluent, being totally taken care of and they hate their parents for creating entitlement and they don't know how to get out of it. But they're making a lot of excuses, that's a different story. But what I realized is that same thing that a 19 year old whose parents have paid for everything and she or he is realizing, wait a minute, I'm a zoo animal and I don't know how to live in the wild. I believe there's a level of entitlement that is rampant amongst the Fortune 500 or biggest companies in the world of thinking that they're entitled to the business. They make audacious, and points of view on their competitive landscape. They say silly things like uh, like make razzes and jokes about emerging competitors who eventually become their biggest issues. And I've been thinking quite a bit about that. And I think it all leads to actually a very interesting place which is ultimately both high net worth parents and executives of very big companies unfortunately are not consumer centric. Unfortunately play within their B2B confines, score on different metrics than the actual end user that they're supposed to be deploying for. And so my luck, and that's what I'll call it, of DNA of only ever being consumer centric has led to the honor of sitting here and talking to you and having people pay attention and all the nice things that have happened to me. And it's fun because there's nothing more entrepreneurial or rogue or disruptive than actually caring about nothing in the middle but the end consumer, pandering to nothing. Not awards, not the press, not the media, not the B2B environments, not the conferences, not the people that are fancy, just the end consumer and building leverage there which ultimately gives you leverage with all the things that I just mentioned that are in the middle. Everybody has an at-bat. The difference. A a what? An at-bat. Yeah. The difference between LeBron and Beyonce in the story I said in the first segment is there are gatekeepers that decide if you could become LeBron and Beyonce. You have to go in AAU basketball. Yeah, you yeah, have to go yeah, to college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The NBA scouts have to know who you are. You are not some random dude in Iowa who's just great at basketball and then you can go to the NBA. Entrepreneurship is somebody watching right now who's never made the leap, who has the talent, they don't need Harvard Business School, they don't need you and I, they need nothing. That's right. If you're good enough, the market will accept you and that fact that we can all have an at bat to mm-hmm. do that is special. And you don't have that. And that's why American Idol worked. People got at bats. It wasn't Clive Davis. And that's what entrepreneurship yeah, you're in saying America there's fewer is. Filters in the entrepreneurship and whether they space, go by the motivation of the you saying you you you've got to do it this way, or if I'm saying it, you got to do it that way, or Cuban says it's that way, or Ferris says it's that way, whatever it is, as long as they keep hearing a lot of different things and make their own recipe, that's what I'm hoping to do. Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. Well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people do. But very few people actually pull the trigger and even fewer succeed. What are the barriers there? Talent. You know, that's disheartening. That means you're just like, you're born, you can either play in the NBA or you can't. No, what, what, you know, that's a very good point. I think it's the following. My brother AJ is a better basketball player than me because he's put in more work on his left hand and his jumper, Mm -hmm. so he deserves it. He's not in the NBA. (laughs) You can be an entrepreneur. The problem is we've lost sight of being an entrepreneur who makes $137,000 a year doing what she or he loves is an amazing life. But right now everybody thinks they're gonna be Mark Zuckerberg. So we've become audacious and ludicrous and delusional in our entrepreneurial uh, ambitions. And so I think we need a level of self-awareness 
I think people are trying to be entrepreneurs at a level we've never seen before because the cost of entry of saying that you're an entrepreneur in your Instagram account is very easy. Right. It's also cool right now. I'm actually quite scared about that because I don't want to be the face of that because I think 95% of people are gonna fail, especially when the economy fails. Let me say something straight to camera. If you're not a successful entrepreneur right now, in the easiest time to be a successful entrepreneur because there's so much money in the system and the internet is at scale, you suck. (laughs) All right, that's some tough love right there. It's the truth. This is the easiest time in the history of life to be a successful entrepreneur and if you're not and you're struggling, then you're not an entrepreneur. Listen, I'd love to be playing for the Jets and the Knicks or be opening the Grammys. It's fun, sounds rad. Mm-hmm. I'm just not capable. Doesn't mean I can't sing better. Doesn't mean I can't be a better football player backyard in Central Park. You gotta put in the work and you have to be self-aware of your upside. The other thing is we have too many students who now think that entrepreneurship is cool. If you weren't selling lemonade and baseball cards or pogs or burning CDs and flipping them in school, like if you don't have sales DNA or operational DNA or it wasn't fun to play store when you were five, you didn't gravitate it towards it naturally, you're gravitating towards it now because it's cool. Right, and I take it you did all those things. All those things. Right. And, and so did so many of the people that are successful that as entrepreneurs. Right, yeah, yeah. The same as singers went to choir. The same as actors signed up for the thespian club freshman year. Right. Like it matters, the work matters, the talent matters. What's your definition of greatness? Uh, you know, I've never really thought of that. You know, it's funny, a couple things ran through my, I'll just go with what ran through my head. First thing that came to mind is that a lot of people know who you are because you've impacted them in a positive way. Um, uh, the second thing that came through my mind was interesting was when you say somebody's name, you feel something. Mm. Like, you know that, you know like when you get nervous, like some version of like excitement and butterflies? Um, I think it's, you know, I'm fascinated by the word great because I think it's one of those words that has absolutely been like, you know, like I I think about sports casting. It's funny, everybody's nostalgic about their youth and you always become the old man or old woman. Like the amount, the way great gets thrown around, Mm -hmm. you know, I'd love to get your perspective on this because you've anchored into this so heavily, but like, yeah, those are, those, you know, those are two things that come to mind. Like that mix between nervousness and excitement uh, in your stomach Or, like, to me, it's like, when you hear a name, like, it's funny, Martin Luther King's birthday was the other day, right? I went to Martin Luther King Middle School. Like, like, I don't think we can wrap our head around the people that have changed the world, because that's a level of selflessness. Like, I'm pumped because I'm gonna be 50% selfless, selfless, and I think I'm gonna be legendary for it. There's people out there that are 100% selfless. I think for entrepreneurship, you have to be 50% of each. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's wild to me that I am gonna be far more successful and great because of the DM that I'm gonna send to a kid tonight than for the 97 things I'm gonna be right about in business over the next century and will make me successful. Um, doing the right thing is always the right thing. There's something in that statement with greatness. I think to be great, you have to be an enigma you have to be like against the status quo. Mm. You have to be willing to say F- work life balance in its current state like I did earlier in the you know segment. So yeah, just just different. Like and invoking a reaction. A human reaction must occur otherwise you're not great. How do you account, you know, how productive you have uh, been as an entrepreneur today? For example, I could write one article and I could be very productive. I could write three uh, three articles but I'm not productive. So how do you actually account of you know, how much work I have done as an entrepreneur. You, it sounds like you're doing what we all do, which is it sounds like you're being your own judge and jury. Right. So I think you just need to love yourself more. Right. <laughs> I'm being serious, it's yes, a very yes. interesting insight. Like when you were asking the question, I think every day I'm phenomenal. I'm being dead serious. Because I'm trying as hard as I can, I have very good intent, I'm really trying, And if today was a less productive day because I was tired or a meeting didn't go well or who knows why, I'm just not capable of beating myself up today. I look at it over the course of time. I mean, you know, you get to be the judge and the jury. 
what I was definitely, when I transitioned from wine to let's say entrepreneurship in my content, it was 2007, eight, nine, and we were going through a global economic crisis. And as you can imagine, as an immigrant who answered your question of what my regret is, I don't, I think it's very difficult to give advice that says, become more talented. Be born with more talent. (laughs) Very not practical. So where I found myself was going to another place that felt very practical to me, and as you can imagine, it's all I ever saw for the first 35 years of my life, which was work ethic, was a controllable part of the game, that if you did that, if you're outworking your competition, practicing after practice, all the things we know about sports and music and theater and acting and all those things, that that was an incredible advantage. And in a time and place where people were getting laid off and things of that nature, it hit the right tone. It was natural to me and the timing was right. The lack of patience, bro. Hmm. I, I mean, it's crazy to me that literally patience and insecurity is 90% of the unlock for everybody listening right now. Hmm. Their mom shit on them their whole life and said they're gonna be a loser, so they believe it, because that's what parenting is. Uh, and they just wanna have a you know, Maserati now. Right. And they'll do whatever it takes right. to do it. And so they'll take, they did something, like do you know how many kids are doing something smart, like doing a good retail arbitrage on Amazon right now and making $100,000 by buying on Alibaba and mm-hmm. selling on Amazon, took a year and a half, three years yeah. to get good at it. But now we're taking every profit and buying some rando cryptocurrency because they're playing the lotto. That's just, re- yeah. this is what's going on in yeah. our society. Like we have to have these conversations. You're saying big gains fast, like let me jump like in. Like there's a kid yeah. who spent three years being disciplined and getting good at retail arbitrage. It's a real skill to have an eye for like what to mm-hmm. buy in China, yeah. how to set up on Amazon properly, how to run ad, like it's a skill. Yeah. They did it for three years meticulously. They made 13,000 and 47,000. Now they finally are making 300,000 and they could be on their way to 10 million, yet they've chosen to kind of stop jump on the short-term bandwagon of buying some weird cryptocurrency hoping it's the next Bitcoin or Ethereum. I'm just seeing that every yeah. day and I'm just like, it's, it's being predicated on short-term. Yeah. You hear one story, Zucks did it. Instagram sold in 550 days for a bit. Now I'm, <laughs> that's why everybody started an app company. Yeah. The follow the leadership, completely predicated on short-term. I went the other way. While everybody was blowing up, I decided to build an agency. Mm-hmm. Boring ass, shitty ass business in the prime of my career uh, when everything was going for me in Silicon Valley. I'm proud of that. The holy grail of life professionally is to love what you're doing and be good at it. You know, there's a lot of people who love what they do and they're okay at it. There's a lot of people that crush at something but hate it. You know, and the only way you'll know that is if you taste more. I always, I always smile when I'm on this kick because I think about oysters a lot. So like I'm really into them and like, like I've gotten pretty knowledgeable about them, like West Coast, East Coast, like that kind of shit. And it's just so funny how many people have decided they don't like oysters without ever having them. And that's how I think about careers. You think you're FinOps, but you're really strategy. You think you're strategy, but you're really account. You think you're project management, but you're really FinOps and I think about that every day. When something is working, Mm -hmm. and clearly things are working for you right now, what I've noticed for a lot of people over the last decade is when something's working from a monetization standpoint, you start losing your balance of jabbing and right hooking. I think in a world where you're monetizing audience coming into things they pay for, that you have to find, and that's why you're doing this, and I think the more things like this, Mm -hmm. where you can provide upfront value with no clear path to transaction, Finding that balance is a challenge for everybody. Right. And most of all, when it's going well. So I don't have a good read on how much free content, Yeah, we do do about 80%. 80% So there you go. So there you go. So then I would say 82%. Yeah. Or 84 (laughs) Because because I mean that, Grant, because what I do know is that people have a much longer life cycle when they disproportionately bring value. Right, right. When you are guilting, and that's the word, guilting guilting people into buying a $1,000 program or a $20 book because you've given them more value. You've given them $1,001 up front, you yep. win. You talked about the, the volume and uh, to get up to 5,000 pieces a day. Yes. Uh, but you also talked about the importance of being uh, uh, relevant yes. and having meaningful content. How do you ensure that you stay relevant to your followers yes. and uh, to... The question is, 
in an ambition of thousands of pieces of content a day, how do I also nail home relevance, which is a big part of it. So ironically, this volume framework inevitably creates relevance. What will happen, it's kind of like a workout plan. If I'm able to get my partners, friends, people I care about, clients, my own stuff, into a framework of volume, inevitably, let's just say somebody was in here and said, approved, and everyone's like, okay, now we do it. Inevitably, tomorrow's board meeting is, well, what are we gonna say? And what you realize is, and this is devastating, like one of the things that's been really fascinating, and we work with very large companies, uh, is once you see it, you can't unsee it. And, it. and the level of visceral negative energy I have towards the modern day marketing world, watching some of my clients starting the process of going there, it's real fun for me because literally a week earlier, they're having this subjective, completely non-practical meeting, and then a month later after the first month of this work, they can't even stay in the room for 10 minutes because it seems so silly. It's like many things in life. Once you see something sometimes, you can't unsee it. So the entire model is built on relevance. All of a sudden, you are making a piece of content to female CIOs in Russia. Because you're making 5,000 pieces of content. Like, you're not gonna make vanilla anymore. You're in the business of selling vanilla. You are. Everything is so over-corporatized and everything's trying to reach everybody, it be, even when the seed of the idea was a good idea, by the time it sees the day of life, it's vanilla. When you've made the commitment to producing volume, everything is relevant because you start becoming educated on how deeply powerful these platforms are, and if I wanna reach a CTO that went to MIT, and I wanna use MIT colors in the creative, because I know that makes her or him more likely to click it. I mean, this is real stuff now. All of a sudden, 5,000, you can't imagine how quickly through a detailed conversation around this, 5,000 seems way too little. Everything, like just think about the two examples I gave you and how your mind's running with the fact that this is actually in perpetuity. Every school, every neighborhood, every geographic, every job title, every organization, like. That's just a framework of seven or eight cohort beginnings that is an X and Y, which allows you to go forever. You could be making content that starts with, hey, are you 28 years old? And the person sees it as, yeah, I am. <laughs> you know, like, you can't imagine how infinite this actually plays out. And so, you know, it, it was fun to hear you ask the question because I was smiling inside. I'm like, it's, it's, once you make the commitment to that framework, the only thing you can do is relevance. And by the way, relevance is the only thing that sells, not potential reach, which is the currency of big companies. GRPs and impressions and the cost of those impressions, potential reach, not actual reach. It's being reported as you reach those people. You don't believe that. You don't believe that article reached 29 million people. Potential reach versus actualized relevant consumption. That is the delta. I also think that when we start demonizing work ethic, we get into a, I, I think we are the byproduct of the last 10 years being so fruitful. You know, a lot of the people that push against me are venture-backed company founders who were able to raise $25 million over four years based on their idea by never running a profitable company. So everybody, and not that they're wrong, I just think everybody has different perspectives. So I think we need to get into a healthier, you know, minimalism, I'm sure, I, I don't know. I assume there's some sort of counter debate to it. And so, oh yeah, yeah, like yeah, there's a minimalism is dead and it's, it's just the whole thing. I mean, it, from the same perspective of hustle, it's like, well, it's not a cult, these are just some ideas. <laughs> I think it's important. Yeah. And I think, you know, for example, I think I both love work ethic and minimalism. And I think they're, you know, I already know that I'm a kind of enigma and have like some pretty contradictions within me. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that because of that, and that's just the luck of the draw of DNA, um, and given the platform that I've earned and have been afforded, 
um, maybe I can create some better conversations because I think, I think it'd be a really good time for all of us in any sector about any debate, red versus white wine, let alone mil- minimalism, anti-minimalism, hustle, anti It's a really good time to get back to a cordial state of debate. I also know it's contextual. Like how can't you tell somebody who's not afforded any opportunities that work ethic isn't gonna help them? There's no, no thing you can pull up that speaks to me saying money is happiness. I wasn't raised in that environment, I know it's not true. How do people shift their mindset even in a horrible time for most people no when they choice. can't even do it during a no great choice. time? E- easy, I'm, my stuff does better during bad times. Crush they it. they have to. Right, you and I hung out during the Crush It book signing, that's when you drove me. Crush it, hit a nerve, because people needed it. 2009, right? Right, and that's when hustle was good. And then hustle during good times becomes manipulated into burnout. Mm. But I promise you right now, I don't use hustle anymore because I understand how the word got mutated into leading to anxiety. And so I don't want that, so I I changed it. Even in Crush it, I talk about nine to five, making 40,000 a year, being happy. But, But I promise you hard work is about to be put on a pedestal again. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, what was your single biggest takeaway from this video? And write down in the comments below when you're going to take action on that takeaway this week. When you schedule in what day, what time, and what place you're gonna take action, you have a 91% chance of actually following through, compared to just 35% if you just got motivated but never created a plan. And when you share your plan and have accountability, you give yourself an even higher chance of following through. So in the comments below, write down your single biggest takeaway as well as your specific plan of action because I want to celebrate with you. If the people that are actual practitioners of any craft are not willing to be aggressive with their convictions to communicate to CFOs, nothing will ever happen. The, the only other, there's only two ways I've ever seen big companies do the right thing. One, a cheerleader who mounted enough political clout to actually get something done. Or two, massive pain at the macro level that has required them to take a deep look at themselves and change their behavior. That's it. Evan, thank you so much for having a couple seconds and being able to tell the Believe Nation a little bit about Empathy Wines, it means a lot to me that you would take this valuable real estate and, and time on your channel to give me some love. It means a lot. It's just good karma points, and so you're just, you're awesome, thank you. Believe Nation, uh, if you're into wine at all, go to empathywines.com. My whole career's work was poured into producing a wine that rivaled 40 to $60 wine for 20 bucks a bottle. Uh, I'm just super excited about this subscription-based wine business. You can order three, six, or 12 bottles in subscription form, rose, white, red. Um, if, you, if you search on Instagram or, or Twitter, you will be blown away. People are literally like, I don't even like Gary Vee, but the wine's good. Super proud of the effort. Thanks, Evan, for the time. Uh, wishing you guys all happy and healthy. To change your life in the next 30 days for free, check the link below me. Or if you want 50 more amazing rules from Gary Vee, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy them. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.